let's continue with graphing square root functions. Now, when we're looking at these next types, we're going to approach them from the perspective of shifts. And let's actually start with the third one here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and graph the parent function that we made right here, the most basic form of square root graphs. And those points end up being a curve like this. And I'll do it in a highlighter so that we understand that this isn't the main one that we're graphing. This highlighter function is y is equal to the square root of x. Now, based upon shifts, a couple things are going to happen. We're first going to need to address this negative sign. What this negative sign does is it flips us across the x-axis. So it makes those first points flip across the x-axis and become those points. And we do have to do flips before we cover the next part, which will be using our h and k values. So this minus 1 makes you want to go to the left, but remember h values are always opposite. So I'm going to go to the right one, and then this one tells me to go down 2. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each of those blue points and go right 1, down 2. Take this next one, right 1, down 2. Take this final one, right 1, down 2. And that allows us to draw out our actual equation that we wanted, which is the f of x is equal to negative square root of x minus 1 minus 2. If you don't follow it from the shift perspective, you are certainly welcome to type this in on the calculator and use the table function in your calculator to find the other points. But you might find that it's quite easy to do it from the shift perspective. Now let's talk about domain and range. Domain's all the x values. The furthest left that we go in this case is negative is positive 1. So x has to be greater than or equal to 1. We also know that because it's the h value. Right? Our h value is a positive 1, which impacts the domain. My k value is a negative 2, which impacts the domain as well. Now, sorry, which impacts the range. When you look at the picture here, we know that y is either, either going to be greater than or less than. And in this case, it's going to be less than because we're opening down. All right. To graph this one, it has a a value, and we're opening down. I'm going to go ahead and graph, and what I'm doing here is I'm taking these blue dots off of this page, which is a reflection of the most basic square root of x function. So these blue dots are y is equal to negative square root of x. But what that 3 is going to cause to happen is it's a stretch. And it changes the distance here of the points. Right? Because these were naturally 1 and 2. That 3 is going to triple it. Now notice that the 0 is still going to start at 0 because I didn't have anything moving us left or moving us right. But I'm going to triple the distance. So instead of this one being down 1, it's down 3. Instead of this one being down 2, it's down 6. What that 3 does is it causes us to decrease 3 times as fast. And we had the negative sign telling us to open down. But that's what the 3 does is it changes the rate at which we grow, but it doesn't shift us left or right any, or up or down, and because that 0, 0 still starts at 0, 0, which means our domain will be x is greater than or equal to 0, because it starts at 0 and goes to the right, and our range will be y is less than or equal to, because we're opening down, 0. And you could also have typed that one into y equals on your calculator and viewed the graph. Let's move on to some application here. One example of what this can be useful for, you know, working with square roots, and we mentioned it in the y, is that it's the opposite of quadratics. It's the inverse of quadratics. 
This is a square root function here that's relating how far you're, you're going to slide, how far you slid when you slam on the brakes in your car, determines how fast you were going. All right, and so this is a function that you, they will use at, at crash sites sometimes to figure out how far a car was sliding before they collided. And they can see, you know, if you slid 50 feet, that means you were going 40 miles an hour. If you slid 100 feet, that means you were going, you know, 55 miles per hour. Um, and we could have looked at the same data from a quadratic perspective, but when we do the inverse, it kind of changes the inputs and outputs to maybe switch this around into an, another frame of reference. Um, if you wanted to find the inverse of this function here, you know, if we if we find the inverse by squaring both sides and then dividing by 30, you get that the distance would be equal to the speed squared divided by 30. You could graph this function if you wanted to look at this same information from the other perspective. And that's all inverses are, is it switches your x and y axis. But in this particular setup, distance is the x axis and speed is the y axis. This one here is going to bring back the concept of inverses in graphing them. So it wanted us to find the inverse of f of x, x squared minus 1. Remember, in order to do that, you do these steps from inverse. This is 5.3. Replace f of x with y. Swap x and y. And you can see these steps happening here. And then resolve for y and replace it with the inverse notation. So what's happened here is that they have correctly found the two inverses. This function here is in fact an inverse with this function here. But I've mentioned that one of them is graphed incorrectly. And I want you to think back on how you can tell visually. Think back through to 5.3 and think about what did it look like for two functions that are inverses to be graphed. Pause the video and think about what visually happened when we graphed two inverses. And then we'll figure out which one's graphed incorrectly. When we graph two inverses, they are symmetrical across the line y is equal to x. So these guys should be reflected perfectly across this diagonal line. And we can see that they are not now, based upon shifts, you might have recognized that the original function here that they did quadratics was a minus 1 as a k value, but they actually moved it up 1, which is wrong. So actually, this whole f of x curve should have started down here. And what you can't see from this graph is that this one does keep going and cross and begin right there because of this h value telling us to go left 1. So this inverse curve ends up looking like that. This quadratic should look like that, and then they would be symmetrical. But the point of this question was to help you understand that inverses must be reflected across the line y is equal to x. So we could tell visually on this scenario that something had gone wrong on their graph of their inverses. So here's some more examples of working with inverses. You know, in geometry, you do a lot of work with, you know, squares, to where a square is length times width is equal to the area, you know, or a side length squared is equal to the area because in a square, both the length and the width are the same. So as often that you guys would work with that formula. But what you can do by simply square rooting both sides is find the inverse of that formula to where now the side length can be determined from the area. And this can be useful because maybe you're building a square patio deck 
and you know the area that you want the, the deck to take up, maybe you then need to take that area and go plug it in to then find your side length. You know, in some of these we would know very quickly, like an area of 9 would be 3 times 3. 25 is going to give us, an. if you have a square that's area 25, unit squared, that means the side lengths are both 5. 36 are both 6. You know, 49 is 7. And then an area of 0 would have side length 0. And you can see this curve going off there. All right. And what this could help us do is now find side lengths with a square with different measurements of area. They asked us for 35. Well, 35 is going to be almost 6, but not quite. You know, so if a, if a square had area of 35 square units, the sides would be almost 6, you know, about 5.9, somewhere in there. And you could do this for any number. So you had a square with an area 30, and you wanted to know how long the sides needed to be about five and a half. And so that's how you can use inverses to rearrange formulas to look at something from a different perspective. We typically worked with side lengths and then found area, but you can find the inverse and have area to help you find side lengths. All right, so here's going to have us find an inverse and graph both the original function and the inverse. All right, I'm going to go ahead and graph the original function first. What it would look like is this. And if you're confused on where I got those from, you could type it in on your calculator of x squared plus 3 and find those values in your table. You could also just plug them in, right? All I did was plug this x coordinate in. You know, 1 squared is 1 plus 3 is 4. That's where I got this 4 from. And I plugged in 2. 2 squared is 4 plus 3 gives me the 7. Let's find the inverse. To find the inverse, we first need to replace f of x with y. And then we swap them. So x is there, y is there. We need to solve for y by subtracting 3 from both sides. I'm going to go ahead and put all those guys on to the right side. And then we square root. And we'll get that y is equal to plus or minus square root of x minus 3. All right, and hopefully from our graphing on the other side, you know that this is telling us to go to the right 3. So instead of starting at 0, 0, like square root of x does, Square root of x minus 3 starts at 3 comma 0. So 3 comma 0. And if you type that in, or if you're familiar with, you know, plugging these numbers in to find it, it would look like that. And then you can see, hey, we graphed this correctly because they are reflected across that line y is equal to x. The only thing we need to come back and fix over here is the fact that we didn't replace that y with its inverse to get that.